Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Power Alliance podcast. I have a phenomenal woman on here today with a story that will, I mean, we could go a million directions with the podcast, so we're just going to see where God takes us. Um, but let, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then we're, and then we're going to actually start the podcast. Hadley Lobster is a copywriter. She's a supportive homeschool coach and a mom blogger at Homeschoolers Life. She comes alive when she can help others turn their business and personal testimonies into profitable content that helps provide for their families while making an impact at the same time. Like, that's my jam right there, girl. That's it. She's based in Cape Town, South Africa with her family. When not writing, she explores creative pursuits like gardening, painting, and the, the simple joys of living. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. So happy to have you. Um, I think in addition to just who you are and your incredible story, I love the fact that I get to connect with such amazing women internationally. Um, it's part of the vision that God shared with me with Girl Power Alliance. So there's like an extra little sparkle to this for me. So thank you so much for taking time out of your, your life and your schedule to be here today. That's great fun. I appreciate it. Um, is there, so I know I read your bio, but would you share just maybe a, a, little, a little bit more about your story with, uh, with everybody listening? Sure. Um, the Homeschooler's Life blog is something that I started just over a year ago, September in 2019. I had bought the domain in May and started writing, created content, and then launched it a few months, months later. We had a local homeschooling expo. I did some networking there. And then we had, shortly after that, like a month later, we had our first African home education in Daba, which is the first continental home education conference. And there were speakers from all over the world, Russia, Canada, US, uh, Kenya, Uganda, um, everywhere. <laughs> and I went to that, it's in another province, so I flew out. And it was the first time I was at such a huge event with so many people from so many different places. And all of these families were there. These couples were there. There were a good fair amount of men, I would say, probably about 25 to 30 men, which is a lot for a conference like this. And it was so validating of family values. It just it blew my mind um, to, have, to, to watch men who showed up in their prof professional capacity and their family capacity and say, we honor the mothers. They are the reason we're here. And we honor the concept of homeschooling as a, as a family right and a blessing and a privilege. And we believe this is the way it should be done. As a, as a mother, as a woman, as a parent, and as someone who intensely agrees with all the values of homeschooling and the freedom of education that goes with that, it was, it was incredibly validating. It's not often that you see men on a stage saying that kind of thing in front of their families and to other families. And from there, I started working with some clients in that niche. Um, today, I currently write monthly for essayhomeschoolers.org, which is our top homeschooling website here. And the bright minds behind that website and the Pestalozzi Trust, which is our homeschool defense fund, um, they are currently working on the legislative framework to fix <laughs> the legislation around homeschooling and improve it and make suggestions of how this could work better to just solve all the problems we have with education here. Personally, for me, that interests me because people spend money on education and I occasionally edit dissertations for students who are studying degrees in education and it's, it's fascinating to see the thinking that people spend their money on. Um, so I wrote the blog with families in mind, with parents in mind, to just make the whole journey less overwhelming because these parents, a lot of them are new. They come to these events and they walk home with a bag full of flyers and it's very overwhelming. Yeah. And then they start asking the same questions on the Facebook groups from beginning to end. And I was like, okay, no. I'm a writer, I'm gonna aggregate all this information and make it like a homeschool map where the parent can go from, how does homeschooling work? What does my child need to, okay, what options will fit my child, my child's needs, my needs, my available resources and my budget? 
And that whole process, that thinking process, helps lessen the overwhelming amount of options that you choose from. Um, because now, even especially this year, there are so many parents who freak out and they buy the first all-in-one system they can find, spend a ton of money they don't have and cannot afford right now. And six months down the line, they are beating themselves up and saying, I suck at homeschooling. <laughs> I can't do this. This is not working for me. But they, they, bought, they bought into something too quickly. They, they didn't do the homework. They didn't take the time. They didn't take the pressure off. And so with a blog, I want to help parents with that to say, hey, look, this idea that new homeschoolers have of other veteran homeschoolers who've been at this for a while, working homeschoolers included, that it's smooth, that we have it together, <laughs> that it works all the time is not true. <laughs> It's totally not true. Well, isn't it just, um, doesn't it validate you and confirm um, God's plan for you that, that you're talking about a year, over a year, a year and a half ago now, this conference yeah. and this stuff and look at the world, like half of the yeah, world. Yeah, it's like now it's like exploding. Yeah, everybody, I like just, people that never would have homeschooled, they're forced into it. So yes. what, a, what an amazing, you know, what an honor that God called mm -hmm. you into this long yeah. before and he knew he knew what was coming yeah as a as a homeschooler i hope that for new parents that the experience is positive and supportive as they enter the homeschooling community to come and ask advice um a lot of the veteran homeschoolers are spending huge amounts of time answering text messages and emails and phone calls about like what do i do and they they do their best to support these new families um because there is also the big factor that COVID schooling and normal homeschooling is not the same thing. Being able to make the decision yourself is much more of a positive and empowering experience than having to be forced to do it and you're stressed out of your mind and panicked about a ton of other stuff that's also consuming most of your time. Um, so we, as, as homeschoolers who were at it before COVID, we spend a lot of time just reassuring and telling parents, calm down, <laughs> it's okay, take the pressure off, take some time, play with your kid, don't panic. It's, it's, you cannot expect a child to learn under that amount of stress. And they cannot learn when you are so super stressed that the both of you are just yelling at each other. It doesn't well, work. You're right. And, um, I have, I, my last child graduated last year, so I have not had to embark. Yay! On this. I know. Um, I, it is very yay considering how insane it is this year. Um, but yeah. I, you know, in addition to homeschooling and you're, and you're not just homeschooling, you're supporting mm -hmm. homeschoolers, you're copywriting for people. Um, you have a yeah. lot, like so many others, but you, your personal story of what goes on kind of behind the scenes with your business is one that I think is is very inspiring. And, and I, I believe is something that um, will give people hope and inspiration if you want to share a little bit about that, the personal sure. stuff that's going on. Yeah. Because I, I feel like what happens for most people, not, not everybody, but for most people, they we get very caught up in kind of the minutia of these things. Like homeschooling's hard yeah. or, like we have to wear whatever masks or all these things that, that are, they're literally this big, but yeah. then you, you like the situation, you blow that it up. It, it's, it's a much bigger, um, it, it, I know to people that are in the minutia, those feel big, but when you have yeah. other things going on that are literally life and death, it makes those things yeah. seem, um, less stressful. So I would love it if you would share mm -hmm. a little bit about like the, per like what's going on in your home. Sure. So what happened before I got to the point of launching a blog, this was about two years ago now, May of 2018. Um, I was working part-time as a copywriter and I was very comfy <laughs> doing that and not building an epically big business or big income. I was enjoying motherhood. I was pregnant with my son. My daughter was about four. And I always had this idea, naive idea, that if something were to happen 
between me and my husband crisis wise health wise it would be me because my husband is a guy who looks like he's at the gym every day he has unbelievable amounts of muscle <laughs> and that's just because the nature of his work is physical he's done mechanical physical work his entire life and so he he looks he looks like a fresh stallion pretty much um and it's it's crazy to think that someone that fit looking and that strong would have a crisis it's just it was not in my mind and he was working in his own business at the time as well and it was not going well we were strained and our relationship was very strained it was taking him longer and longer to do things he would have these times where he would sit and be exhausted and no matter what you said he would not get up and do anything he would just like zone out and he could fall asleep with complete chaos around him and i thought well it's it's a weird quirk <laughs> i kind of envied it yeah. didn't think all that much about it um and occasional random episodes of vomiting which we attrib- attributed to his vertigo issues so all of these like disconnected odd symptoms didn't seem much of a big deal until that time may may 24th of 2018 he collapsed at the bottom of the stairs he was in extreme pain he was very cold and yes it was winter but he's a guy who's normally running hot i'm the cold one and he took a bath to ease some pain and he was lying under a blanket holding a hot water bottle he was wearing a jersey he was lying in front of a heater and he couldn't heat up and that's when i started freaking out and i was like okay if this is if he's complaining of abdominal pain and it's this bad i better get him to the hospital if this is a, his appendix i've i've had that so it's 11 o'clock at night i sent my daughter to my parents home and i took the baby my son was by that point 6 month 6 months old i had been working the first 6 months of his life and we drive to the hospital and i remember leaving him in the waiting triage area and i had to go home i was not allowed to wait around with a baby at that time of mm. day and i remember looking at him and feeling this distinct premonition like an ease in my gut i did not like this and i told myself mentally look if it's his appendix it will be out by tomorrow afternoon when you see him again so chillax and i drove home went to bed and the next morning i had some errands to run missed some phone calls got to my parents house and my dad sat me down and said the hospital phoned it's not his appendix surgery's canceled he's being moved to tigerberg hospital which is a teaching hospital here and even if you do have medical aid which we don't um they will send you there if you have a very rare situation all the best specialists and best training people are there so they said no he has heart failure and i'm like what he's 36 like you got to be kidding and they're like no it's heart failure and there's a fistula which is uh an arterial venous malformation it's a situation where It's similar to people who have an aneurysm in the brain except the aneurysm isn't in the brain. It's in his abdominal space and it's the size of a tennis ball. There's a bunch of spaghetti-like veins that feed blood supply to this thing. And they did every kind of imaging and they cannot determine how many and which of those veins also supply blood to the lower organs, the pancreas, the kidneys, the adrenals, the rectum, everything. So they looked at him and they said sir nobody's going to touch you surgery is not an option the risk of bleeding out on the table is very very high and they gave him some painkillers after 2 weeks and sent him home and said we'll phone you five excruciating weeks went by the longest five weeks of my life and the vascular surgeon said look he's looking for an interventional radiologist to take on this case there aren't a lot in the country um he'll get back to us as soon as he has something to say and by this point they had told us that Sean's case is like one of five recorded cases in the world the other four were operated on two didn't make it the other two survived but they have organ malfunction which is not the greatest quality Gosh. of life so they are not keen on operating um at least not here um getting him anywhere internationally is 
is a logistical nightmare because he can't stand the g-force of flying oh uh, that that left off g-force is too much um because he permanently feels kind of like someone is holding a pillow in front of his face or like he's having a heart attack um and there's nothing they can really do about that um so then a couple of months later in september 2018 they did a glue embolization where they take neurosurgical glue and tiny catheters and they squirt that into as many of the veins as they can to try and take pressure off of the heart. And they said, look, you'll, you could feel okay, you could feel better, or you could feel the same. We have no idea, but it's worth a shot. So they did that. Five hours later, it was successful. No complications, but the benefit only lasted six weeks and then he was back to square one. Oh, wow. So they said, we're not going to do it again. It's not worth it. Like, okay. Um, and then he would have like these dips. They sent him home with painkillers and said, you know, just don't overdo it. Go home. And in between that time, I had been to the doctor myself. I was getting sick with something. And I had a bump on my head that was just very painful and very itchy at the same time. My doctor cut it out, found me two days later and said, hey, this is basal cell cancer. Please go see the dermatologist for a full skin checkup. And I'm like, uh, what? I don't have the time for this. My husband was due to go for the procedure like two weeks from then. And I went to see the dermatologist and he's like, um, yeah, you're going to need to either get this treated further or risk having it spread like downwards, the, the cancer grows downwards. It doesn't spread sideways. So they don't like that one, even though it's a slow growing. It's, it's the best of the skin cancers to get, <laughs> given the other options. Um, so I took some treatment, some natural health treatment for the skin cancer that I know works. And three months later, the dermatologist couldn't find the lesion on my head. He couldn't find the scar. And he said, that looks great. There's just one pre-cancer I would like to cut out on your shoulder blade. <laughs> so I was getting like a tiny couple of, I had stitches on my head and stitches on my shoulder that year. And Sean had his procedure and that's how he got through 2018. My gosh. Last year, I was, beginning of last year, I was praying a lot. I would go to bed every night and I'm sure a lot of people are going through this exact same thing right now which is why I want to share it. I would go to bed and every night I would have this little hamster wheel in my mind going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Clearly, Sean is not going to return to normal. He cannot work like he used to. Um, he cannot do heavy lifting. He cannot do anything that makes his heart go crazy. What am I going to do? I was not prepared for this financially or in any other way. Um, and I was freaking out and I knew that I couldn't head for the first corporate job I could find in the city because a, it's a long commute Two, I would not be able to deliver under that kind of stress an hour's drive away from home. I needed to be there. if Something happened because my children are tiny yeah. and my parents are aging. So I, I felt kind of stuck and I said, okay, God, now what? And this hamster wheel in my brain would go night after night. And one night I stopped and I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to sleep for once. I'm going to go to sleep and I'm going to trust God. And that's what I'm going to do. So like I interrupted that pattern with that answer and I went to sleep and I said, okay, God, I need to reboot my business and make it simple. Focus on the services that I most enjoy providing and that are simple to provide and I'll do that and I'll build something for long-term passive income on the side. So that's where the idea of homeschool as life came from because I was always going to homeschool anyway from like grade one. I just ended up starting sooner <laughs> and I changed my copywriting business and I started House of Blogs to just focus on providing content services where I write website copy and long form SEO optimized blog copy for companies. And the companies I focus on are companies that work with people. So as in nothing to do with tech or software or finance or insurance, 
if your business is about people and helping people and informing people, making a positive difference in any way, I'm happy to hear your story and help with your content. There's so a lot from there. Those. Yeah, there's a lot of those. <laughs> Also, anything educational, by education, I don't just mean like school stuff, anything that sets out to inform your audience how to better their lives, empower their lives, improve it, anything natural health related is also a big passion of mine. Um, so I started focusing on that. And in between, I really had to trust God because it's, it's, it's like I have a sick husband on the one end, my aging parents on the other and two young children who need me. And I was like, God, I never anticipated to be in this role. I never anticipated to be in this situation where I'm now the healthiest of the four of us adults. <laughs> I have a small frame. I'm not built like a tank. I'm the one who with the slightly like vulnerable health history here. So I really felt the pressure. I felt the responsibility every time I looked at my family and to not operate from that heavily loaded uh, mindset has been a journey. It's a constant laying my family at God's feet prayer process. Um, on the days where things are harder, it's, it's a faith choice to go, God, I cannot carry my entire family. I cannot fix everybody. I cannot help everybody. I can barely help myself some days. I need the Lord to help me. Um, Sean in January he had a bout where he was sick for two weeks. And I was like, are we, are we going downhill? Is he going to come out of this? Is he going to stabilize again? You never know from one scenario to the next. So it's, it's funny. Prior to this year and the whole COVID thing, I've had the last two years of living with an enormous amount of uncertainty that can go in any number of ways and dramatically affect everything about my life and my children's life. And I've had to come to a place where, okay, I cannot control any of that. I can plan out in my mind what I would do in each type of scenario, just so that I've gone there and can stop obsessing. But ultimately, all of us, all of my loved ones are in God's hands, whether I'm comfortable with how things play out or not I've just had to force myself to say God no matter what happens whether he has a horrific crisis or a peaceful one however this plays out whatever time of day this would play out wherever my children are in that given moment I need you and I know that you will be there for me and I know that I will have what I need when I need it up until that point, I have to live in the now and do what I can do now. There are days where it's not easy. You, as, a, as a woman, as a mother, we are prone to worry. We are prone to look at scenarios around us and go, I need to control this. <laughs> I need to plan for this. And you're planning for something that doesn't even happen yet. You're worrying about something that hasn't necessarily happened. It could. And you're telling yourself you're being responsible to do all the worrying. You're not. Um, it's not helpful. It's not helpful. Sean had, case in point, like last year, he had in July and August two incidents where he would vomit constantly, like round after round. And by like round three, I am terrified because it's not normal the way it is for a normal person where once everything is out of your system, you can go, okay, I'm going to be fine now. I'm, I'm done. For him, it puts intense pressure on his heart. The pain is intense. He gets very pale. Um, and it, it could lead to cardiac arrest. Mm. I'm just, you just never know. There's nothing that tells you how this is going to play. And both those times, I took him to the hospital. They put him on a drip. They retested and rescanned everything. The first time they sent him home and said, we can't understand the reason for your pain. Everything's the same. Um, the second time, five weeks later, it happened again, and he went back, and they said, okay, here's the explanation. Sporadically, the blood flow to his intestines shut down, and then whatever he's eating will come back up. And he came home, and he told me this, and I'm like, okay. 
I can't even blame this on anything. It's, it wasn't anything I cooked. It's not like I right. can say, if he has gastro, then this. Or if he has a bug, then this or that. There's no sequence. There is no rhyme or reason. And we were both a bit rattled. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's been a journey for the both of us to find each other and find peace in the moment, in the moments where we're okay and we're with our children. You get a new perspective of what matters, yeah. math and homeschooling and whether your child knows the alphabet backwards, takes a back seat. You just, in that moment when you see your little girl who is very much a daddy's girl, she's very much like him as well. You see her coping very, very well considering her age. She was about, she turned five a month after he was diagnosed. You see her coping bravely and quite well. And you think you just, you just want your kids to be okay. You just want your child to be okay and happy and to not have to deal with life and death at five or six years old. Um, and you find yourself having very different scenarios play out in your mind you're not thinking about your child's schooling so much you're not thinking about um planning or curriculum or even planning activities you're just thinking of if daddy feels good today and he wants to take the kids out or walk around the dam yes go you you think about things like um just every moment that your children get to have their father. Well, it really gives and you the opportunity to, uh, it really gives you the opportunity to keep the main thing, the main thing and to yes. not let any of the, the stuff that most of us get so caught mm -hmm. up in. You have such a different perspective on, um, really taking every moment you know, yes. taking every moment, enjoying it for what it is, knowing that, you know, you have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. And I think that people that go through these types of traumas, I mean, this mm -hmm. is trauma that you're, you're living in trauma, you know, not knowing what each day Funny. is going to bring. You have a very unique perspective on faith because you are surviving because of your faith. And, uh, I have a, my older sister had terminal cancer. And so, uh, it was, you know, I think only people that go through some type of traumatic, either terminal illness or an accident, or, yeah. you know, I think only people that go through that have this different kind of view. I mean, you literally have a different view on things. Yeah. Um, you look at life a different way and I know that you're in, you're literally in it. Those of you that are listening to this mm -hmm. podcast or watching the YouTube, she's not speaking on the other side of it. She's in it. She's living in it. And so, yeah. um, you, whether you realize it or not, you're extraordinarily strong, you're extraordinarily brave and your faith is extraordinarily inspiring. And so I just want to speak into you that every ear that hears this podcast is going to be praying with and for you for a miracle for your husband, number one, um, for yeah. supernatural strength for you, number two, and number three, that God will, will continue to be and will uh, be the God of provision for your family. Um, you already heard what mm -hmm. services she provides. Um, I'm going to ask you in a second to make sure everybody knows how they can connect with you. But um, I believe wholeheartedly in the fact that this community of believers will rally around a need. And so this is a family in need of massive prayer, um, prayer for provision financially, prayer for miraculous healing and or provision for, you know, the right doctor that can, uh, that can help with this particular yeah. ailment confidently to bring a solution that bring that is life-giving, not a solution yes. that takes you down another Definitely. path of problems. And so yeah. I'm, I'm a firm believer that through, through this network of believers, somehow somebody's going to listen to this podcast that has answers or help or know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. 
I, I wholeheartedly, mm-hmm. wholeheartedly believe that. So would you, would you now tell everybody how they can connect with you, how they find you uh, via websites or social media or, or all of the above? Sure. Um, just before I get into that, there's just something I feel I'd like to mention. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what I wanted to say now was, oh my word, that thought went right out of my head now. That's all right. Um, when your children walk in. I wanna, you, were, you were talking about when you're in it and I wanted to just tell the listeners, everybody who's watching this, if you're in the middle of it, yes, there are days where you throw tantrums at God and that is normal. There are days where I don't feel like my faith is up here. There are days where I feel like, God, I'm trusting you, but I, I don't see a way out. And there are days where God has to kind of just nudge my heart forward and I have to let him and it's not comfortable. There are days where I would really be happy to have this over with. I would love to be telling the story from the other side. The the through part going through these things, everybody's through process looks different and it feels different. You will have different moments of pain and different moments of joy. And that's also normal. Um, embrace both. Faith is not being comfortable. Faith is not always about the mountaintop. It's about being where it's scary, where death is a very real possibility, where you have you, you feel like you have no idea where you're going and what you're doing. And at the same time, at the exact same time, in your spirit, you can have a certain knowledge that God is still with you, that you can still feel his hand underneath you, even though you can't see what he's doing. Um, and that helps enormously in those moments where you feel like you want to quit. Because if you quit, if you, if you give up your faith, you have nothing left except overwhelming, terrifying fear. Yes. That's crippling. And from that position, you can do nothing. From that position, you cannot move, move forward. You cannot help your children. You cannot support your family. You cannot get up in the morning without feeling like you're going to die from sheer dread. So I want to encourage the listeners, if you're in the middle of something, God is with you. The way you feel is not permanent. Yes, the way you feel is real and it's valid, but it's, it's not permanent. It does not define your faith. It does not define who you are as a person. And it does not define what God thinks of you in the situation. Um, life happens and things break and people make choices and mistakes happen and they, they cost a lot, some of these things. Some of these scenarios cost you more than you ever bargained for. You land up in roles and in stories you never wanted to be in. I did. I never saw myself playing out the story of being a full-time working homeschool mom with two tiny kids and a sick partner. Um, that was not the story I would have picked. <laughs> and that's the story I'm in. And I have to say, I have had to reach the point where I said, okay, God, if this is my story, I will accept the story. I will accept what you are doing in and through my life, through this story. I will own it so that at least I can help others in the same or similar boat. Because it's better than just drowning (laughs) in my own boat. It's better than shooting a hole of self-pity in my own boat and just sinking. Yeah. Um, So I want to share that. And then as for where you can find me, my copywriting website is houseofblogs.net. So if you want to make contact, you're welcome to send me an email to writing at houseofblogs.net. I am on Facebook at my homeschool Facebook page is Homeschoolers Life. And I'm on Instagram under One Homeschoolers Life. And yeah, those are the platforms I'm on. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm not as active on there, but my profile is on there. Um, and if you are 
a listener who is in the position where you need to turn your expertise and your career into online content that can add an income stream, I'm happy to help you create course content, eBooks, other monetizable assets and create the framework for you, work with you to create a container for what you know and what you do so that you can make a bigger impact on a larger scale. Well, I appreciate so I appreciate your story, your strength, um, what you are continuing to step into every single day with just absolute uh, faith and courage. And uh, don't worry, all the things that she said will be in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just right below the video, all the information will be um, in, uh, in that section right there. And we are praying for you. We're praying for your family. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to be on here um, and share your story. And uh, I'm expecting a miracle for you. So are we. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.